All right, everyone, we're going to get started. And my panelists, give me the thumbs up if they can see my slides. Thank you, thank you. So welcome, welcome to the Center on Race and Social Problems here at the University of Pittsburgh. My name is Jay Hughley. I am the uh, interim director of the center. You may know that the University of Pittsburgh is one of the national leaders among universities for anti-racist work for education and programming, addressing anti-Black racism. And our center is a big part of that effort here. Uh, we are supported by the Office of the Provost here, and we are housed in the School of Social Work, uh, one of the interdisciplinary gem gems of, and a gem, but one of the interdisciplinary gems on our campus and pretty much any campus, and um, one of the top ranked schools in the country. So. We're very happy to be with you today. This is the third of three sessions of our Fall Institute on Race, Politics, and Fighting Voter Suppression. And we had some big name speakers earlier in the day uh, that um, really address some key issues, a lot of the history of voter suppression, a lot of the history of race in the political parties. I would argue that this may be the most important session that we have today because we're, we're talking to experts on the ground that are doing this work day in and day out to address voter suppression and address the issues that, that our communities are facing, the black community and other communities of color in particular. So very excited about that. Um, we actually have, I'm very, very honored to be joined by one of our great um, new colleagues here at the University of Pittsburgh real rising star in inner field, uh, Dr. Josefina Banales from Pitt Psychology and the Learning Research and Development Center. And she is going to be the co-host, co-moderator for this day to say a little bit about her. Dr. Banales is an assistant professor in developmental psychology and the Learning Research and Development Center here at the University of Pittsburgh. Her research examines adolescents' critical racial consciousness development or how you develop beliefs, feelings, and behaviors that challenge racism. She investigates the extent to which social context, also known as racial ethnic messages from parents and schools, and individual social cultural factors like ethnic racial identity inform youth critical racial consciousness development. She's very interested in all these things impact student uh, engagement and in civic processes and in justice oriented processes. So she's a great fit for this panel and she's gonna help us to make it happen today. So Dr. Banyales, I'd like to welcome you. How are you today? Hello, Dr. Hughley, appreciate the introduction and likewise, super excited to, to moderate the session with you today. Great, great. So take it away. What, what, let me say a little bit about the process. We're gonna introduce each of the speakers one at a time. They're each going to take seven to 10 minutes uh, to tell you about their work and the significance of their work for the issues we're here to discuss. And then we'll save 20, 30 minutes in the end for Q&A. All right, so with no further ado. All right, so I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. McClendon. So Dr. Gina McClendon is the Director of the Voter Access and Engagement and the Financial Capability and Assets asset building initiatives at the Center for Social Development. Her work focuses on policy research analysts in consultation with community-based programs, ad academic institutions, state and federal policymakers, and advocacy groups. Dr. McClendon's program development and policy advocacy work centers on issues related to voter suppression and civic participation of low and moderate income households and marginalized populations. Her research focuses on finding and advancing practice and policy strategies that support an inclusive democracy and the professional training of social work students with an intentional focus on race. Dr. McClendon earned a PhD in urban higher education from Jackson State University, received her Master of Management and Leadership from Bon Bon University in St. Louis, and a Bachelor of Science degree from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. So without further ado, Dr. McClendon. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to participate. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes? Is that a yes? Okay. All right. So um, I um, 
Yeah, I'm really excited uh, about this this entire topic because voting is it's just it's everything. So I've got a short clip that I want to show that sets the stage for the work that I do and, and why I do it. So let me know if there are any problems with it. I love the vote. It was instilled in us to vote. My grandma raised me up and my sister up to vote. You know, when we turned 18, that was all right. <laughs> um, the address when I registered was 7660 Bridgeman Service. I'm going to have to have you go and stand in that line so they can update you. Okay. All right. Next voter, please. Hello, Michael Evan Hires. Verify that your address and information is correct. You sign at the bottom. There you go. Thank you very much. I need a picture. I got an old one. Here, is this your address? You know me. You have something we can't do. I'm at the bank place. She told me I could not vote at all because I got to re-register because I'm I'm nowhere in the system. They're not making it easy at all. It's it's tiresome. Yeah. Yep, we got to clean the rolls up one way or another. I happened to stumble across the Phantom Voter Project. I started looking at my neighborhood and started finding what I believe to be a bunch of fraudulent registrations and started investigating them. It's about time we turned the lights on in the kitchen and started cleaning the cockroaches out of here. When I found out um, that I was purged off the rolls, and I was highly upset about it. Because, I, like I said, I mean, I grew up seeing my family vote. I know it's my God-given right today to vote, and I want to vote. The board found probable cause to go forward on a total of 3,564 voter registrations challenges, all of which were submitted by Mr. Michael Hires. Yariza Burgos, Robin Bruns, Christopher Carmichael, Tina Carmichael, Justin Freeman, Christopher Carter, Rachel, Cheryl, Carson, Nancy's. Again, that's 3,564 of those challenges the board found probable cause on to go forward. This is a big, you know, big win, really, as far as the numbers go. Good, good golly. This meeting is adjourned. So I'm, I'm going to stop there because I, I think you get the, the message. Um, one of the reasons why this is so important is because there's always something happening, and especially in recent years, around um, a threat to our democracy. And let me just say that for the Voter Access and Engagement Initiative, it isn't about who you vote for. It is the ability to vote. It is having that right to vote. And um, so the, another way that we kind of look at this is in terms of uh, democracy and crisis that's rooted in racism. So, you know, from voter suppression with targeted strategies towards black and, and people of color and the list goes on. But I want you to take a look at the couple of pictures over here on the side that, um, you know, if you think about it, there isn't any difference. This picture is prior to the voter, um, the, the VRA that passed in, um, in 1965, but there isn't a, a lot of difference between this and what's happening today. And so all of voting and everything is, is connected to all of this. And I just think that um, that is the, the basis for some of the work that we do. So in thinking about the Voter Access and Engagement Initiative, think of it in the words of, the, of um, um, Maya Angelou. Rise. And so we do research to influence practice and policy. Uh, we believe that yeah, an inclusive democracy is important and talk about the threats and, and what are the opportunities to make sure that democracy thrives. Um, the S is for support of advocacy and engagement efforts to create a culture of voting. And then the third, it, uh, the fourth is engage and train new generation of voter protectors. And for us, uh, we're talking about social workers 
or social policy or public health. Those are all the three programs that are at the Brown School at Washington University. These are a couple of the activities that, that we do along with the research. We do work with election protection and poll worker recruitment. We participate with national organizations. The picture on the right is a um, march that we had, a, we called it a Good Trouble Voter Awareness March that has happened in several multiple cities under the direction of the Transformative Justice Coalition. And then we host webinars, um, we host other kinds of convenings to educate people, one of which was the, we do documentaries and have discussions about that. And then what I found is that it's super, super important to have a relationship and build relationships with the election, uh, local election authorities. So just a little bit about, we did a research project. So it, with, with anything, you have to start with a question, you have to start with research. And so we did a research project um, in 2018, where we worked with uh, the St. Louis City and St. Louis County election authorities, and we collected data using student researchers. We went through a whole recruitment process, and um, and our hypothesis was simply this: that voting access at, at a with a sample of St. Louis area polling sites in November 2018 differed by race and income. Why is that important? Because in St. Louis city and county, St. Louis, this whole area is very, very segregated. Um, and um, a concern was that, that voting was not equal in all polling places. So we selected 20 polling places, 10 in St. Louis city and 10 in St. Louis county. Now I'm saying the difference, St. Louis county, St. Louis city, the difference is, is that in most municip most areas, there is maybe one county that encompasses the whole metro area. But in St. Louis, there's a county, St. Louis City is a county by itself, and St. Louis County represents um, the suburbs of St. Louis. These are the basic questions that we ask. Is our voting procedures and practices are approximately the same in different polling places? So is, is everything equal when it comes to the, like, the voting process as well as the infrastructure? And again, um, to what extent are race and income related to the electoral process and access to voting? The, this is just a little sample of how we made our decision and, and what the statistics look like in the 20 polling places where we were. And then this is, uh, tells the story of our key findings. What you just saw on that short clip is a little, it's basically what we saw here, what I have here. And, um, you know, one of the things that, that I have to point out is that um, while things may vary from poll place to, to poll place, sometimes it's not necessarily all the fault of an election authority. Um, it, it, uh, to me, there's a bigger issue around systems around things that are, aren't coordinated. So just having a lack of a voter law at, a, at the federal level um, creates issues. And so I am going to, I think I'm gonna stop there. Oh.
All right, thank you, Dr. McClendon. Um, I want to introduce our, uh, our next speaker. Bhavani Patel is a CEO and co-founder of Beam Data, a civic tech company that operates at the intersection of social issues and data. Her company created Be The Change, a participatory civic action app that allows people to provide feedback on legislative issues and share community causes directly with their elected officials. In 2019, Bhavani was a candidate for Allegheny County City uh, Council, Allegheny County Council District 8, and came in second in a competitive three-way race. In 2020, she was appointed to the Pennsylvania Medical Marijuana Advisory Board and also currently serves as a Biden delegate in the 2020 Democratic National Convention. As a Pittsburgh native, Bhavani volunteers her time on the board of several organizations, including the University of Pittsburgh MQE Advisory Board, Second Generation PAC, uh, the Bhutanese Community Association of Pittsburgh, and Civically uh, Incorporated. She earned her MPhil in International Relations from the University of Oxford. That's a pretty good school. As a Rotary Global Grant Scholar and a BPhil in International Area Studies from the University of Pittsburgh. Also a pretty good school. She has been recognized as a Rhodes Scholarship finalist and most recently 30 under 30 by Pittsburgh Business Times, 40 under 40 by Pittsburgh Magazine and a finalist for the Athena Young Professional Award. So everyone, please welcome Bhavani Patel. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, as was mentioned, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Beam Data, which is a civic tech company that's based out of Pittsburgh. Um, and we really do kind of exist at the intersection of data, social justice, and policy. Um, we, we firmly be believe in the sort of transformative power of data and its ability to elevate and scale organizing and advocacy efforts to ensure communities that are oftentimes um, not at the center of different conversations when it comes to things like voter education or le legislative advocacy are prioritized. Um, and so we sort of do this work by providing community-based tools, uh, community-based tech tools that allow people to write the narratives of their own neighborhoods. And this sort of philosophy of why we believe this is important really kind of stems from my own personal race. Um, when I ran for Allegheny County Council and knocked on a lot of different doors, I very quickly realized that um, people live in their neighborhoods and have very real and visceral reactions to the decisions that are made in their communities. They're oftentimes also sort of the holders of socioeconomic transitions, the ups and downs of what's going on in their communities. And there should be a better way for these stories and these narratives to be captured and allowed a space um, when it comes to decision making and um, policy building. And so uh, what we realized is that it's, it's the average person, right? The person who's a healthcare worker, the grocery store worker, the urban planners, artists, designers, they are really the experts of their communities. And we really wanted to capture this in the tools that we built at Beam Data, which is why we decided to go uh, forward with an idea called Be the Change, which is our core effort at Beam Data. And Be the Change is actually a civic action app that encourages year round civic engagement and civic learning, as opposed to just um, efforts that we oftentimes see coming up during election time. We really try to create a sustainable uh, kind of infrastructure for people to stay informed um, on various issues that are happening um, at the legislative level. And so the way that uh, Be the Change works is that it connects you to your state legislators. So once you download the app, which is free for everyone to use, um, you can download the app and we request an address, whether that's your home address or the address of a community center. And based on the information that you provide, we basically tell you who your state representative and state uh, senator are. And then uh, invite you to share different community causes in the form of legislative feedback or different neighborhood concerns that you, be, you might be noticing in your area. We sort of do the, the organizing work of encouraging the elected officials to onboard with us. And so when that happens, what that means is that the elected official informs their constituency through various methods uh, that they're on this app, that they're responsive, 
but they also ensure that there's a legislative aid that's dedicated to responding to the different community causes that are coming through on the app, whether that's concerns around voter suppression, um, if somebody decides to use the app for that. Uh, but there is a hotline that's, that's, that should be used to, to um, report those concerns, which I'm sure we'll be discussing sooner or later. But also questions about um, how to vote, right? There's been so many kind of open-ended uh, questions around um, mail-in ballots and naked ballots and things like that. And so there is somebody on the other end who would uh, provide um, resources to get the answers that you need for that. And so um, uh, it, it, this is sort of important to us uh, because we see that social media is oftentimes used as an opportunity or um, various platforms to communicate with our elected officials. And that can oftentimes turn into uh, divisive rhetoric in many ways. It, it can seem unconstructive um, and not necessarily leave people with um, avenues to take action and, and, and make positive change in their community. And so the way that Be the Change is built is that when somebody does share a community cause in their neighborhood, there's basically a public feed. So anybody can kind of see what's being shared in their um, in their areas and get a sense of what their neighborhood uh, and neighbors care about organizing around. And they can upvote and downvote those causes um, and, and build momentum around the issues that they prioritize. And this is really important to us as a, as a team because we were really passionate about sort of um, democratizing data in a sense and giving advocacy organizations, nonprofits, and other sort of grassroots efforts the power and the momentum to take advantage of what data has to offer so that they could be more efficient and organized um, with their outreach work. And so uh, I look forward to diving into this a little bit more during the Q&A um, and the discussion portion, but I, my sort of core mission and, and I guess what I wanna kind of emphasize today is that there's a lot of really um, important uh, questions that need to be answered in the lead up to November. And, and um, I'm sure that a lot of those will be answered today, but I really hope that we can all consistently be thinking about, you know, there's so much energy and momentum that's built around this election cycle and ensuring that people have a place uh, in terms of when it comes to voting and feeling comfortable that they can do that and cast their ballot. But how can we also take this existing infrastructure, this exciting momentum that we see, this information sharing, and ensure that we keep that going past November as well, that we really ingrain civic engagement and um, civic learning beyond November so that we can build long-term systems to ensure that people are part of the system, that their voices are being heard, and that they, um, you know, they have the information to be um, efficient advocates for their communities. Um, so that's that's a bit about that, and I'll uh, be sure to share more about the app in the the chat section as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate you sharing. Um, I personally have lots of questions for you that we'll definitely wait for Q&A, but just questions around like accessibility of the app, right? Youth involvement, right? Immigrant folks involvement. So I'll, I'll save it for later. Um, but thank you for sharing. Super exciting and important work. So next we are going to chat with Ron Bandis. So Ron is the Election Integrity Director for the League of Women Voters of Greater Pittsburgh and the president of Vote Algany, a nonpartisan election integrity organization. He was a cybersecurity member of the Pennsylvania Legislature's Committee on Voting Systems Technology. He is an active member of several election integrity organizations, including the Election Verification Network. Bandis has contributed to the Election Law Review Committee for the League of Women Voters Pennsylvania and helped design a remote ballot marketing system for the National Federation of the Blind. He presents on election integrity at the National Conference of State Legislatures, the National Security Agency, the Pennsylvania Department of State's Election Policy Summit and around town. He is a judge of elections in Pittsburgh. And is as retired from working as a network security analyst. Take it away. Thank you so much, Josefina, for that introduction. Let me start my slides and my timer, I guess. There we go. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, speaking first about the League of Women Voters. Uh, we do so many things around elections. Uh, one committee in the League of Women Voters is the Voter Services Committee. And we do a tremendous amount about disseminating information. So information about how to vote, what the rules are, how to find your polling place, what your ballot's going to look like, but also information about the candidates, uh, which is all nonpartisan information. Uh, in fact, 
with respect to the candidates, the candidates supply their own information. We do not edit uh, what they write. Um, but we also have uh, all, all kinds of, of other information out there. Um, and we conduct candidate forums, which are uh, uh, widely appreciated, again, nonpartisan. And uh, this year, of course, that was very challenging. We had to do our candidate forums online. I think that the League of Greater Pittsburgh was one of the first leagues in, in the nation to uh, do that online. And we put a tremendous amount of time and effort into making sure that that would come off as smoothly as possible. And I, I think we achieved that. So let me proceed with my slides. Okay, so my approach here is going to be, I'm going to point out uh, amongst the procedures that are in place in Pennsylvania and particularly in Allegheny County, but with special emphasis on what can go wrong. So wherever you see red print on my slides, those are danger areas. They, they, those are places where the voter could make a mistake or otherwise have their vote not counted. So there are three ways to register to vote uh, online by mail and in person in Pennsylvania, but that ended yesterday. So it is now too late to register for the November 3rd election. There are also three ways to vote, uh, in person on election day, by mail, or in person early at either the elections division office in your county or at a satellite location and many counties, but not all in Pennsylvania have satellite offices of the elections division office. So if you're voting in person on election day at your assigned polling place, you can find your polling place with uh, these tools here. The first tool I gave is only for Allegheny County, but it's a little bit better than the state tool. Uh, the second link uh, will work anywhere in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., but if you are in line by 8 p.m., even if the line is long, even if it takes you till 2 a.m. to get to the front of the line, you get to vote. The danger is that the uh, poll workers may not understand that and may try to close the poll at 8 p.m. So this is one of the places where voters may need help, and I'll be talking about election protection a little bit at the end. Also, if this is the first time you're voting at all in Pennsylvania, or if it's the first time in a new election district because you moved to another part of the county or to another county in Pennsylvania, you will be asked for ID again, although it does not have to be photo ID. There is a long list of things you can use to prove your identity, uh, but there are some things that won't work. So a driver's license from Pennsylvania works, a driver's license from another state does not. There are many other examples. If you're voting by mail, um, you need to leave time for many transits through the mail system, sending in your application, getting your ballot, sending back your ballot. There is no longer time really for all three of those things to happen. So it's going to be difficult to vote by mail at this point, but you can also vote in person early, which is on my next slide. But Voting by mail or voting early in person, which really is voting by mail without the mail, uh, have the same uh, danger areas. So one is that you need to make sure you got the right ballot. Allegheny County recently uh, sent out the wrong ballot to almost 29,000 voters. And I just learned today that some of those voters uh, that got their new ballots, they all got new supposedly corrected ballots, but apparently some of those are wrong as well. Uh, it's necessary to mark your ballot correctly. We use hand marked paper ballots in Allegheny County and in many other counties of Pennsylvania. All Pennsylvania counties are now using paper records or ballots. So in some counties, you'll never touch your ballot. You mark it on a machine, but it does create a piece of paper. In Allegheny County, you either hand mark the ballot or you use a machine to mark the ballot for you, but our machine does give you the machine marked ballot when you're done. Either way, when you're done hand marking or machine marking your ballot, you take it to a scanner where it will be tabulated immediately. So on the hand marked ballot, you must completely fill in the ovals. If you put in a check mark or an X, you run the danger that the scanner will not recognize that. And if you put a circle outside the oval, the scanner will definitely not recognize that. And it's really important not to make corrections because the scanner will not understand. If you cross out uh, one filled in oval and fill in another, the scanner is gonna see that you filled in two ovals 
And if that's a race where you can only vote for one, then you overvoted and that race will not count unless you ask uh, the machine to give you your ballot back, which you can do. Um, it's necessary. Uh, one of the previous presenters talked about naked ballots. Uh, a naked ballot is one in which you put the ballot directly into the return mail envelope, forgetting to first enclose the ballot in a secrecy envelope. And the point here is that the person opening the return mail envelope, which has your identity clearly visible on the outside, uh, should not be able to see how you voted. So when they open the return mail envelope, all they get from inside should be a secrecy envelope that goes into a stack of secrecy envelopes. Another, poll, another uh, official opens the secrecy envelopes and they can see how you voted, but they don't know who you are. So nobody should be able to have both of those pieces of information, both who you are and how you voted. So the uh, Pennsylvania Supreme Court recently upheld the Pennsylvania law saying that vote, uh, ballots not ensconced in a secrecy envelope will not be counted. So this is a danger area. You also have to remember to sign the return mail envelope and you have to get it back in time. Uh, applications for uh, mail-in ballots are due in one week, October 27th, which again, there's time to do that at the office. There's not really time to do that through the mail anymore. And the ballot itself, must be turned in or postmarked by November 3rd. Uh, that's this year only. Uh, normally, the new Pennsylvania law says that your ballot actually has to be received by November 3rd, but the courts are allowing in this election for them to be just postmarked by November 3rd. If you're voting in person early, it's really the same set of uh, danger areas. So you go to uh, the elections division office or a satellite office, and you do everything you would have done through the mail without the mail. So you can do it all in one visit, apply for your ballot, get your ballot, mark your ballot, turn, and submit your ballot all in one visit, but it still needs to be enclosed in two envelopes. We have satellite offices in Allegheny County. Uh, we've had them for just three weekends. One of those weekends is still coming up. The other two weekends I've crossed off because they are in the past. And so I've also crossed off the satellite locations that will not be open on that third weekend. You can also, as I say, vote uh, either over the counter, doing the whole process, applying for the ballot, getting your ballot, submitting your ballot all in one visit in the uh, elections division office on the sixth floor downtown, or you can go to a satellite office um, I'm sorry, not satellite office. You can go to the lobby of the same building um, and there you'll be able to turn in ballots, but you have to go upstairs to the sixth floor if you wanna go through the whole process. But if you already got your ballot through the mail and just wanna turn it in in person, you can do that in the lobby and not even have to pay for parking and worry about a parking ticket. You'll be in and out in a flash. If you make a mistake on your ballot, as I started to indicate earlier, um, you cannot uh, just cross out one filled in oval and mark another. The scanner will not understand. It's necessary to exchange your erroneous ballot with a fresh ballot, which you can do either at the elections division office. Um, actually, I think you can only do that at the election division office early or on election day, you can do that at your assigned polling place. Satellite offices are not prepared to, uh, to do this. And once again, if you are going to uh, exchange your ballot on election day at the polling place, and I think even in the office, it is necessary to not only turn in the ballot you incorrectly marked, but you must also turn in the return mail envelope that identifies you and has a barcode just for you. And if you don't do that, if you bring in only the ballot, you will not be able to exchange your ballot for a fresh one and on election day, you would then be able to vote a provisional ballot, which will be counted once they see that you did not return a mail ballot, but it will not be counted for a week after election day. So again, if you don't have your ballot for any reason, if you never received it even, even though that's not your fault. If you never received your ballot, but one was sent to you, you cannot vote a regular ballot and, and put it in the scanner on election day at your polling place but you uh, could vote a provisional ballot. So once again, provisional ballot 
uh, is set aside until they can ensure that you did not mail in a mail-in ballot, and then they will count it about a week after election day. So there's a lot of talk about poll watchers and particularly poll watchers who mean to disrupt uh, operations at polling places. And we are fortunate in Pennsylvania that our state constitution does not allow just anyone to be milling around inside our polling places. That you do have to have a poll watcher certificate in order to be uh, an observer inside the polling place. So that mitigates that problem somewhat. We did get robocalls with false information about um, uh, uh, telling people that uh, uh, telling people that if they go to the polls and have outstanding debt or outstanding warrants, they'll be arrested at the polling places. This is patently false. It's intimidation, and we can't have it. So if you have trouble with any of these things, the thing to do is to call 866-OUR-VOTE which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan coalition of organizations, including the League of Women Voters of the United States, where you can uh, make complaints. And they not only can guide you, but they also can call the county division of elections and help to straighten things out. And they have a cadre of lawyers on hand to do that. And you see here that we also have phone numbers for people who don't speak English. And we also have some special election protection hotlines for voters with uh, special needs. So there's one for people who uh, cannot hear and uh, can reach somebody on a video call to get assistance with American Sign Language. And also person who is running into problems due to their disabilities, maybe their polling place is not handicap accessible and they can call the Disability Rights Pennsylvania for assistance with that. So thank you so much. Ron, thank you very much for that presentation. Thank you to uh, all of our panelists uh, for all this information. And uh, I want to kick off the Q&A by first letting our audience know, please submit your questions for the panelists. And the um, question and answer is the best way to do it. And uh, all the panelists, you can now you know, reveal yourselves, like a game show or something. Um, please reveal yourself so uh, people can see you. And uh, I'm going to say the first question. And we've gotten a lot of different information here, which is wonderful. Now we hear about voter suppression. We also hear about voter uh, voter fraud, right? And so um, my, my my sort of centralizing question, and I'll, and I'll start with Dr. McClendon, but I open it up to the panel. What is the biggest threat to the integrity of the election as far as you know suppression mechanisms or fraud a real thing? Uh, what do you think is the biggest threat to the integrity of the election in, in two weeks? Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, what is the biggest threat? Eh, there, there are just so many different things. Um, I think one of the bigger ones at this point that I've been focusing on a lot is um, social media disinformation and misinformation. That is, is very big, and I think it isn't um, talked about enough. That That's one thing. The other thing is a threat is, is a lack of knowledge and understanding about making a plan to vote. I think a, a lot of people don't realize that you need a plan. You just can't, you know, it, it's challenging just to wake up and say, oh, I think I'll go vote when it's just not that simple because every state has so many different rules. Um, I think the other challenge is that people don't quite understand or have, there isn't a, a culture of voting and I didn't get a chance to really talk about that before. But what I mean by that is that many people don't understand the intersections between voting, criminal justice, social justice, racial justice, all of that matters because who you, who's in office determines um, how we live as a society. So um, I, I think those are the, big, the bigger pieces. So one of the other, other things, uh, and I, I totally agree with everything that Dr. McClendon said. Uh, one of the other areas uh, is gerrymandering, which is the drawing of district lines for your Congress rep uh, congressional representatives and for your representatives in the state legislature, the General Assembly here in Pennsylvania. Um, and since the majority party 
in the General Assembly gets to draw the lines for both of those purposes, for congressional offices and for offices in the General Assembly, they basically you now have candidates choosing their voters instead of voters choosing their candidates. And, and this is something the League of Women Voters works very hard on um, and has a special project called Fair Districts PA in Pennsylvania. Um, and I would argue that it is actually not necessarily, gerrymandering isn't necessarily good for all the members of the majority party even, that mainly it benefits the leadership of the party and the rank and file, not always so much. So it really is a bad thing for everyone, not just for the minority party. Um, if I could just add on to, to what Ron just talked about in Missouri, they, we passed a law called Clean Missouri a couple of years ago. And now um, there is a, 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 an initiative that was brought forth by the legislature that would um, reverse what was done. So we had, it was set up so that an outside organization could draw the lines, draw the boundaries, you know, for the maps and things like that. So they're trying to change that. But here's an extra thing that, that is included in this bill where the lines would be drawn based on voter population. It would not include kids. It would not include um, people who are immigrants or people who are not citizens. So, you know, we're, we're, this is extremely serious. So be on the lookout. If something like that passes in Missouri, I'm sure other states will try to do the same thing. And in fact, uh, the president and his party are uh, trying to do that now with changing the United States census, which directly impacts uh, districts for U.S. Congress, not and to some extent also the uh, even within the state, the General Assembly seats, um, and trying to, for example, not count non-citizens in the census. Just a follow-up question to the increase of misinformation. Um, could you all just comment on, you know, certain communities in your experience and through your research that you find that are most susceptible to being exposed to misinformation and then just maybe some strategies um, or, or resources to share with folks on the call to be more critical of political content through social media, through the television, through the newspapers? Go ahead. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. oh. No, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I, I think a couple of things that I've noticed, I, I think to Ron's point about the census, that's really important as well. I mean, I've had personal family members who have had people doing door to door canvassing to do, you know, to, to get out the, the count um, towards the end of the days. And there were concerns just about, um, you know, are these immigrant uh, immigration officers that are trying to knock on our door and get our information? You know, how is this how are they going to take the documents that they're recording about our family household numbers, et cetera, where are they gonna be used? And I think a lot of that actually does come from the information that's been perpetuated in the news and seeing our president talk about these, these sorts of things in, in, in ways that um, is elicit fear. Uh, and so I think that's something that we also see when it comes to, to voting. There are a lot of unanswered questions. And, and I think going back to the previous question, I, I also think it's important to talk about the mental health component of this. I mean. There are a lot of people who are just exhausted with all the information that's been coming through the news. It's almost that we've been over inundated with information mm -hmm. and we have lost the ability to extract what is fact and what is not real. Um, and whenever we're, you know, we're so consumed by our social media uh, feeds as well, especially with my generation, that it's difficult to, to kind of parse that information. And, and so I think um, this is really where kind of grassroots efforts really come in is kind of showcasing the importance of voting in a culture in, in a way that would be uh, that the younger folks would be also receptive to right that your vote does matter and here are the implications of not voting and here's how it can help you accomplish the goals that you want to accomplish it's really difficult i think to keep that energy and that momentum high especially when you feel like even if i try to vote there's somebody that's going to be there that's going to try to repress my ability to vote so why should i even try that's, I think, a lot of the kind of feelings that are going on in some of these communities. Um, and we still feel that, and we're so close to election day. You know, here in Pittsburgh, I think there's actually perhaps uh, a counter uh, to what 
many people's expectations might be when you, you asked about which communities might be uh, most severely affected. But I, it, it, it's my experience that in Pittsburgh that the black community is actually one of the most informed communities, that they have some wonderful organizations here like the Black Political Empowerment Project and the NAACP that are out there on the front lines making sure that, uh, that people are well informed. Thank you all for those responses. We have a question from the audience. Can I drop my elderly mother's filled out ballot at the elections division office downtown or one of the drop boxes outside a regional voting center? Or do so, I yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, so the short answer is uh, you're only supposed to bring your own ballot to the uh, elections office or to a satellite office. However, uh, for a person who has a disability or illness that prevents them from delivering their own ballot, they can make out a bit of paperwork to designate an agent to deliver their ballot to the office. And you should be able to find that form on uh, the Pennsylvania Department of State website, votespa.com. We have another audience question, and you. This is uh for you, Ron. You mentioned that gerrymandering benefits party leadership, but not necessarily rank and file. And someone asked very specifically, how does gerrymandering benefit leadership? Um, I, I knew I was going to get in trouble with that one because gerrymandering is actually not my specialty. Um, we have lots of people at the league who are much more knowledgeable in it than I am. But of course, it's the leadership that really gets to draw the lines, right? I mean, they're, they're going to create the map. They're going to tell the members of their own party which way to vote, right, to vote for this map. And so they get what they want. And so, uh, so in gerrymandering, there are two basic strategies, cracking and packing. And the idea being that either you find a concentration of a group that you don't want to have power and you crack that into several districts so that they don't have a majority voice in any of those districts. Or if you can't completely make sure that uh, a group is voiceless, then you give them one district because you're gonna to have to give them at least one. So you give them one and you pack everybody you can from that group into that one district so they don't have a voice in any other district. And so of course, uh, the, the member of your own party, the member of the majority party in that district that they're packing loses, right? So they, they sacrificed one of their own uh, uh, for the greater good of their party, but not the greater good of, of the citizens. A question for Bhavani, when you think about the, when you think about technology and the future of technology and voting, I know you, you created technology uh, to engage voters to advocate for voter rights. Do you see technology playing a bigger process in the voting process itself? We've had someone this morning advocate for voting via cell phone. Uh, what do you think are the possibilities in that room? I think that technology has a big, big role to play in terms of voter education and kind of getting out the vote. I think that that's kind of where I see a lot of existing startups playing a big role just in terms of providing um, ballot information. So like, you know, if you are a voter and you're a nervous voter, but you want to know what your ballot's going to look like ahead of the time so you can make a game plan, there are new startups that are actually doing that where you, they, they basically find the voter, the guides of what their actual ballots will look like across the country. So you can download this app and get that information and make a plan and, and understand what's going on. I also think that it's it's important to consider the lead up to the vote, right? So do you know how your government's functioning, right? Do you know who your state legislators are? Are you engaging with them? Are you staying up to date on the legislative process? Are you understanding the different issues that are being uh, taken up in, in Harrisburg, for instance? And as Ron was talking about, there, you know, there are going to be a lot of different legislative bills that are going to be coming up when it comes to redistricting and how those committees are going to be formed and how those decisions are made. I think that technology has a big role in terms of um, almost mitigating and combating that misinformation that we see on social media. It's, it's almost about thinking about how we can take a subset of conversations that are happening on social media and put them in a more constructive environment where people actually are called to action um, and, and to, to be stronger advocates for their community. 
And so, yes, I mean, I think that there's a lot of work to be done, but I think that there are a lot of um, innovative companies here in Pittsburgh that are working towards these goals and that there's a lot to look forward to. Yeah, uh, if I could quickly also, uh, technology can be very useful also in election protection. So I know there's one group creating a, an app right now called CSAY that uh, similar to an app that the ACLU has had for years, not just for voting, but uh, in general, where you can record uh, an incident happening, you can file a report easily uh, from your cell phone. So technology could be very useful for that. As for internet voting, uh, that is voting through your cell phone or other internet attached devices, uh, it's a perfectly awful idea. Um, <laughs> <I'm not. laughs> Uh, for so many reasons, um, you know, people say, well, I, I do banking online. Let me tell you that the security challenges in voting are much greater than the security challenges in banking. There are no receipts. There's no insurance. Uh, there's just lots of problems. The device you're voting from is not owned by the elections infrastructure, right? It's owned by individuals and it might be in any condition whatsoever, including badly infected with uh, malicious software. Appreciate those comments and thoughts. Next question, gearing towards more of what you mentioned, Dr. McClendon, in your um, presentation, you presented some compelling data and compelling maps on how race and income intersect and is relating to access to voting. So we were hoping if you can share your thoughts on how voter suppression um, is alive today and across racial lines and how you've seen voter suppression evolve throughout the decades. Okay, that's a, a pretty big question, but so um, the, the, the short answer is that um, because I have an opportunity to, to do research and also be on the ground, I can actually see it for myself. Um, I see the difference in what happened in one poll place in a high populated black community versus a high populated white community. The lines are longer, um, the machines break more, more police presence, all this sort of stuff seems to happen. But I think what people critically need to understand is that the, the racism that exists and the voter suppression that exists began, it starts and ends with the Constitution. You know, from, from the moment um, the Constitution was ratified, voting was only permissible for white males. And then when you look at the 13th and 14th and 15th and 19th amendment, you know, amendments, those are all things that are tied to, to being able to vote. And, and so it, all of this stuff is always sort of coming, trying to fix a problem that if it was just in the constitution in the first place, then it, it wouldn't be as much a, a, of an issue. Um, the other thing that I see that and I think we talked about this a little, someone mentioned this a little earlier about transportation. Um, transportation is an issue. Um, Missouri has a voter ID law, that, which currently is in, is in a state position. You don't have to have a state ID, but here's a problem. All of the DMVs are, are, within a, are not within uh, less than two hour bus ride round trip to get to a DMV to get an ID. So, you know, the, it's, it's always um, something constant that keeps people from being able to, to vote, those sort of suppressive kinds of things that happen. Um, you know, voter fraud is thrown around a lot. We've talked about this, we talked about this all day and um, it's, it's sort of been a tactic. I mean, if you go way back, it was it was a democratic tactic in the in, in the nineteenth century uh, to require the kinds of um, you know, testing and 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 poll uh, issues at the poll that would keep certain groups out and people are concerned. It's used as a tactic in the twentieth century and now uh, as a political tactic, but not an act uh, of something of of actual concern. So, is voter fraud a concern? We heard some statistics earlier today that it's really a minuscule um, phenomenon. It doesn't happen very often and in the, in the, in it's played up. Is that true, fair, or accurate? So first of all, um, people use the term voter fraud when they perhaps mean election fraud. 
So it's only voter fraud if it's committed by the voter. But there is also the possibility of fraud by officials. That said, um, the amount of fraud we've been able to detect has been exceedingly small. And so protections that are uh, intended to stop a type of election fraud and perhaps voter fraud that then disenfranchises many, many more times of people than that because of uh, restrictive voter ID laws that, for example, if your ID ha uh, has your middle initial, but the elections division has you registered without your middle initial, and, and states like Texas, and I'm not certain, but I think actually Missouri also uh, ha have such laws, uh, are going to disenfranchise many, many more people than even if uh, uh, fraud did occur because of voter impersonation, which is the only thing that uh, photo ID uh, uh, can, can, can stop. There are many kinds of election fraud. I mean, we certainly know stories from Tammany Hall in the, uh, I think it was early 19th century in New York City. Uh, so fraud can happen. It is important to have protections, but it's important to make sure that your protections aren't going to disenfranchise more people than you are going to protect. I would echo what, what Ron said um, about that. In that clip that I showed at first, um, I don't think, I didn't finish it, but there's a, a piece in that documentary where a man in Texas was arrested supposedly for, for voter fraud. And, and I say supposedly loosely. What happened with him is that um, he had a felony and he went to vote. But when he went to go vote, he asked the poll That's right. if he could vote. They told him yes. Well, he has the exact same name as his grandfather. And so what the poll worker didn't do was look at the date of birth. They, she did a name match with his, with his credentials and told him that he could vote. So, you know, does, does voter fraud ex exist? <laughs> um, you know, in my opinion, it's, it's very, 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 very low. And they're extenuating circumstances by which that happens. So, in most, in many cases. And we're running out of time. I want to ask one last question. Give everybody the, your ten-second answer on this. But what is the most important thing you think people can do between now and November third uh, to ensure that they're to ensure that they can vote, to ensure that the people around them are empowered to vote? You could well, take. I, oh, go ahead, please. No, oh, I was going to say that if you're if you're planning to vote on election day, take water, take um, hand warmers, take medicine if you have medicine that you need to take. Make sure that you're hydrated and that you're prepared to stand in line. Um, if you've already voted, I would say find a way to help somebody else get there, participate with election protection, become a poll worker. Um, the other, and the final thing I want to say is start preparing yourself mentally because we will not know. There's a good chance we won't know who the winner of some of our elections are on election day. And don't be discouraged by that because this particular time in voting, there's so many people that are doing it. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it's important for you not to be confused or disillusioned because we may not know the outcome of the election on November 3rd. Yeah, giving someone, giving people rides to the polls would be an excellent uh, th thing to do. So I echo that. Um, Yeah, I, I would echo Dr. McLennan's um, efforts. I, I think it's important to recognize that this isn't going to be a normal election in terms of results. Like we're not going to feel that gratification coming in towards the evening. And I don't think people are uh, letting that sink in as much as they should. We, we should be prepared for that. And then also make a plan to vote. I mean, visual, like visualize the steps that you would take in your head. If you could, if you feel comfortable with your plan, you know, call up your, your family, your friends and ask them the same question because it, it, it truly will make all the difference when you can plan it out in your head and actually know how you're going to take those steps. Right. On that note, we are out of time. I want to thank our fantastic panel, um, Dr. McClendon, Bhavani Patel, Bhavani Patel, sorry, and Ron Bendis. Uh, 
you all are great and doing really, really important work. Follow them. Uh, if, you, if you're following us throughout the day, which you should be on um, facebook.com slash pit crisp, I feel like I'm doing advertising, um, which I am. You'll see connections to their work. And so very important in these last two weeks, get that work out. Dr. Banales, thank you so much for joining us. And um, you should check out our research, really good stuff, getting youth engaged um, in, in, in the justice process and um, talking about race and how that matters. And so we have a few more uh, content pieces that are gonna happen on Facebook through, through the end of the day, through five o'clock. Stay with us. Thank you for joining this feature session and continue to follow us at Pit Crisp as we keep you abreast of all the important topics in race in the United States. So thank you all, thank our panelists, and we'll see you later. Thanks to my fellow panelists and to the organizers. Thank you.